it's not that easy for me either. Yeah. Ha-ha. I, I, I told you John would be fashionably late. <laughs> fashionable <Greeting>. indeed. <laughs> I love your shirt, John. Oh, thank you. Hmm. Yo, you, you, you're wearing the same colors I am. <laughs> I, I, mine's a little bit on the more I mean, perhaps redder side yours might be on the more okay. eggplant uh, plum like plum plum I would go with plum plum okay yeah or burgundy. burgundy 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 yeah okay I'll well, drink it hi everybody <laughs> hello <laughs> let me get some coffee Uh-oh. can we drink <laughs> it's a cafe. <laughs> Whatever you want. This is a cafe. Yeah. <laughs> is it limited to like coffee and tea and water? I have water, but no. You might not want to do the ayahuasca uh, today. <laughs> <laughs> hey, is that is that is that Mark Edward? That yeah, is. Oh, hi. Yeah, How are I, you? I'm your trigger. Oh, yeah. <laughs> trigger warning across my head. Oh, yes, your voice sounds familiar. Great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, How are you, John? Good. I just had a uh, cold shower at the gym, and I was on my bike running through Midtown traffic. I didn't get killed, so I'm here, you know. Okay. Wonderful. Well, uh, we're, Mark and I are both in Colorado. I don't. Uh, the weather could be kind of variable, um, even from you know, city to city. Um, but here it's a beautiful spring day. Oh, I just like went. It. I was just out for a little walk around the park, and so, and I have tea. Actually, I'm drinking tea. I'm drinking a glass of vodka. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Cheers, everybody. Cheers. <laughs> So uh, I was saying that I think Doug, uh, I know Doug is not joining us uh, tonight. I know you have a, uh, you and TJ and Doug will be uh, getting together tomorrow evening. Uh, Yeah, it's the Eastern Standard Time Magicians. All right. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's so hard to coordinate these international events. We're still tremendously constrained, you know. So uh, TJ had... Um, he had proposed the reading Gidley, but he wasn't able to join us on these calls. So um, the three of us are going to get together and brainstorm about whatever we want to brainstorm about, but mm-hmm. probably something to do with this cafe. Mm-hmm. Will yeah, you that's be, tomorrow. It, it, will Gid, Gidley's uh, paper be the explicit uh, topic of discussion? Well, maybe. I'm not sure. But we'll have a clean start. We'll get something going. But I think it's going to be reflecting on uh, the combination of, you know, TJ had put a lot of work into the um, human cycle, the Aurobindo, and he had proposed this Gidley paper, and um, we've done that. So I'm sure he has some reflections because he's been uh, following us, uh, even though he wasn't able to be on the calls. So we'll find out, and, and I think we're going to record it. So we whoever's interested in finding out we can you can get updated on that when that conference call comes up so Mm -hmm. i think this is a great you know use of our uh, technology is we can have these little spin-off groups that uh you know that can be recorded and may have some use and value to the to the larger group so um because i think we're we're talking about momentum and how to create momentum and we have these monthly events that occur, and then we have this particular cafe, which is a weekly event. Um, And those those monthly events can handle a a large reading, but this weekly event is usually like a paper um, or an article or a video or movie or something. But I think Gidley's paper was so large, we divided it up over two sessions. So I think that's sort of a, this is a really big paper to handle. I felt that I certainly felt that that way, uh, and I distinctly felt last week that um, we hadn't really given enough time, uh, time space to to this paper. It's it's really not 
just a paper. It's a book, really. Well, it's almost a book. Yeah. yeah, it's almost a book. It's it's just on that thre- threshold. And so I'm glad we had another week. I have to say that even after another week and having read through the whole paper book, um, I don't know how we're going to cover everything in it. Um, th- there's so many. There's, she says so much and she uh, brings uh, so many distinct strands uh, together into this, as she describes it, tapestry, um, that we could follow any number of them. Uh, I agree. And, agree. and we, uh, you know, I know I'm interested in a number of them. I, 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 and I can also recognize others that I'm perhaps less interested in, but that I think could also be a salient or that someone else might want to pick up on. So I wanted to say a note about the technology and, you know, because we tend to take a more critical perspective on technology as such uh, in these conversations, specifically in the Cosmos uh, Cafe, at least to date, historically, uh, we've, uh, I think, been critical. Ooh. Do we have a new guest? We do. All right. Hello. I see the name Susan McIntosh. I don't hear a voice. Must be a bot. <laughs> <laughs> we had one of those last year. The name is Russian. familiar, so maybe not. <laughs> hey, Sue, can you hear us? Um, there's a chat function on the, on the Zoom app. And maybe if you can't hear or see us, we can chat. I'm just going to finish my point. Um, yeah, you were talking about the dark side of technology, I well, think. Well, I, I was talking about <laughs> And how we overrate it. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and low. Case in point. Well, she disappeared. She disappeared. She okay. was just this apparition. Uh, not even an apparition. She was kind of the placeholder for an apparition. <laughs> so we heard nothing, saw nothing. She was... She was like the the ever uh, receding object that we could never know. The thing in itself. The, <laughs> the, <laughs> anyway, um, I've, I'm really quite desperate, actually, to make it easier to coordinate these conversations at the technological level, at the interface level. Um, everything around scheduling, putting things on the calendar, inviting, reminding, following, um, and really just making sense of having some ability to separate signal from noise. Um, I think we need to, and I think we can, I, I see it in vision in a visionary mode uh, and to some extent in implementation mode, but I think we can make it a lot easier. And I, I, I would like for anybody to be able to join this forum and it, initiate a conversation like the ones that we're having and without a lot of technical knowledge you know just by following simple prompts uh go through the the process of uh you know initiating it inviting people having it recorded having it posted all of that i think really should be um able to be automated in some sense just part of the interface so that just like you've undertaken this initiative to schedule a call with TJ and, and, and Doug or however that arose, that could happen more, more, more fr- frequently and easily, but importantly, in a way that is accessible in this sort of lateral way. So even if I don't participate in that particular conversation, there's a way for me to um, benefit from it because I can listen to it afterward. I could... Uh, um, you know, perhaps uh, if I search for a particular term, uh, it might ref- it might come up as uh, something that you discussed. So it could even be years from now that I find something that that was discussed earlier, and it becomes a significant artifact uh, for 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 me as the a researcher or explorer or whatever whatever relationship I have to the material. Um, so anyhow, I'm, I'm I just um. 
kind of, uh, I'm thinking about it a lot. Uh, I'm aware that it can be confusing to join a conversation, to follow the, the threads. Uh, I've heard that feedback from multiple angles. Uh, and so, so this may be Susan again. Ah, and, and well, this is one of those things like where, you know, what if there was some kind of a mechanism where if somebody wants to join, they're new, they kind of get this waiting room or something where they could be brought into the call in a, in a, you know, in a more uh, fluid way. There are all kinds of things like that that I'm, I'm paying attention to. And it's not really at that level of philosophical, I think, question. I think it just has to be done. Um, and uh, at the same time, you know, there are interesting philosophical issues around really how we convene conversations like this. And I, and I find even in Gidley, uh, and I think certainly in some of the other thinkers that we've been exploring that have, you know, made an appearance on the forum, uh, such as Aaron Manning, <laughs> Oh, Susan, <laughs> chat with us if if you uh, can see the chat, if you can hear us. This is an interesting problem. It's like a black box, sort of. How do we communicate when there's no... Um, hmm. So, is this a, a... Nobody knows Susan? She's brand new? I don't, I've, I've not uh, had the pleasure of meeting Susan yet. I don't know her either. And this is driving me crazy. I need, <laughs> we need to make a decision here. Either we block her, or we're going to stand, sit here in silence indefinitely. Because mm -hmm. this is breaking my concentration. Traumatic. I think you offended her, Charles. Well, sorry. <laughs> that's, my personal, name, that's my personal truth. <laughs> the, the name is familiar. Uh, so you show I will, up today, you can't get on. You know, let's move on. Yeah. I, so, I, I want to I'm appreciate you what you were saying, Marco, but it's hard because you've been interrupted three times. So that, that's okay. I think my thought is complete. And well, actually, what was it? not only complete, but it's even, it's even illustrated. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and so uh, I, the name is familiar to me, and I, I'm going to follow up uh, by searching on the forum for Susan uh, and or in you know, my email records or something like that. So I'll follow up with her. But um, we were talking about convening these conversations and the attention to how we do what we are doing. One aspect of it is technological. Another aspect, however, is, you know, is, is another aspect we'd say is the content, but another aspect has to do with the performance. It has to do with uh, how we come together and, and um, how the conversations grow. So uh, I, you know, to, to transition to the, to the, you know, the ostensible topic of our talk today, we uh, are doing our second talk now on Jennifer Gidley's, our paper book, The Evolution of Consciousness as a Planetary Imperative, an Integration of Integral Views. And um, what I think we were saying before the technical interruptions were that there's a lot woven in here, multiple threads that could be, we could pick up, uh, and things that I'm interested in, things I, recognize that others may may be interested in so i would you know be i would i think i'm curious to hear how you know you how you all um have uh, integrated or related to the you know the integration or the integration integral um intent uh of this text and what you find salient and uh what threads really we can put on the table here to uh potentially weave together That's a great intro. Thank you. <laughs> then, jump in, John. then jump in. Then jump in. 
Okay, I'll jump in. Um, this was a huge piece, and I um, uh, I think that I also read the, is it Benedictor, the essay mm -hmm. on postmodernism? And I looked at Hampson's um, essay on postmodernism. And so I was sort of putting together Benedictor and Hampson, who's, who you had, you had marked him out, um, Marco, mm -hmm. another essay of his, um, and Gidley. Gary Hampson, yeah. Who, who is in correspondence with Gidley. Uh, yes. Mentions him. Yes. So those are the, so I've been going back and forth looking at all of them. And, um, and I'm looking at my own, my own personal history because I live at very near NYU, which was like a hotbed of postmodernism back in the 80s. And I think I mentioned on the forum that I, so many nights in some of the bars, I was surrounded by these frat boys talk, quoting, you know, they're all drunk and they were quoting Derrida and Heidegger and uh, who's the other one, the famous, um, not Deleuze. Foucault. Oh, it was Foucault. It was Foucault. Foucault. Over and over. And, you know, and I, they, they were driving me nuts. <laughs> but I remember, uh, you know, all this, uh, the superior tone that they seem to promote, which reminded me of these, you know, these, uh, these French philosophy professors where they're really tight turtleneck sweaters, you know, <laughs> and um, smoking their, their cigarettes in crowded cafes. And it was um, a kind of atmosphere of anything goes. And I was sort of opposed to it because I was um, in the middle of the AIDS epidemic and um, lots of people I knew were dying, were sick and dying of a mysterious disease. And uh, there was also a medicalization process that was uh, being imposed that I felt uh, r reminded me of the worst uh, scenarios from n the Nazi era, you know, where people had to get tested. And if you were, uh, if you tested uh, positive, you were, basically quarantined and uh you know and congress was debating whether to put people away who were uh, tested positive for hiv and and uh you know sailed off onto an island somewhere <clears throat> like they had leprosy so these were the so i was uh, very aware that there wasn't much in this postmodern dialogue that was going to be of any use to my community under siege however i was able to queer theory started to emerge out of that. And um, queer theory proved to be extremely useful in combating some of the, the thought viruses promoted by the, the, the fundamentalists. Um, you know, people who are thumping their Bibles and telling us that we were going to go to hell. And I said, you know, and I used a lot of queer theory, entered into their world and, uh, you know, showed them that Jesus, when he said to Mary of Magdalene, who have who hath condemned thee, woman? And she said, no man, Lord, or no man, Mabai. And, and uh, he said, neither do I condemn thee. Go thy ways in peace. You know, uh, and I, when I would say this to these Bible thumpers, they were shocked because I was gay and I knew the Bible as well as they did. <laughs> you know? And they didn't know what to say because I turned to basics said, no, I'm not going to go to hell. You're going to go to hell. Um, so... I'm just looking at all of the different strategies that I was able to use. And, um, and some of them worked, some of them didn't work, but they were learning, you know, and, the, the, and the, we learned collectively, collaboratively together to move forward with multiple agendas. So I'm looking back at my own personal engagement in the, in the, the ideas that uh, I was drawn to and that I could use. And Gilbert and Wilbur was one of them. And I started reading him in the 80s and I was reading him in the 90s. And I also joined uh, the Wilbur group that's formed, I think it, it was sort of in the early, uh, right after 9-11, or maybe it was before, but it was around that time. Um, there was a, a, a Wilbur movement here. So I saw a lot of the excesses and, uh, and I saw some of the virtues of Wilbur's way of working. But one of the things I think I learned from this paper is uh, that Wilbur, unlike Gebser, and this is what I think uh, uh, our author here, what she's really serving us really well by pointing out Steiner, Gebser, 
Wilbur, also there's Aurobindo, all these various kind, various uh, different uh, integral integralisms or integrals uh, operating. Uh, and um, the difference, uh, I think she points out, that is a difference that I think makes a difference is Wilbur was looking at further stages beyond integral, whereas Gebser was reopening up previous structures or stages. Well, actually, Wilbur, let me, let me rephrase that. Wilbur was looking at further structures beyond integral. Gebser was reopening to previous structures like the, the magical, the archaic, the mythical. And integral for him was the higher octave of those previous stages, including the rational. Whereas Wilbur was talking about first tier, which is what Gebser covers in the archaic, magical, mythical, rational. Those are the, that's what Wilbur called first tier. Integral was what he called second tier. And then he and uh, Cohen, I think, were members of what they were calling the third tier, <laughs> which I thought was like way, way up there in the balcony. No one could see them and they probably couldn't see you either. And I thought that metaphor really sucked, the idea of three, three tiers. And it seemed to me to be come out of a very rigid hierarchy, uh, the, the worst kind of elitism. And I thought just smacked of neo, neoliberalism and, and hubris and pride and all that stuff. I mean, I told them that too, the group that was here in New York and they all like, they basically tarred and feathered me, <laughs> they threw me out. <laughs> so I, do, I would never want to be a member of a, of a group that would have me as a member. <laughs> putting Grafto Marx there. So anyway, that's my spiel. And what I found drawn to Gebser as a, as a corrective to this Wilbur brainwashing, um, imagining that we were going to go to third tier, then we could look down on all of humanity, um, was this idea of reawakening the, the, the magical, the archaic, um, the mythic. And, and that in that reawakening, a deeper integration can unfold that he called integral, bringing along the rational as well. And um, that to me just seemed to fit so much more accurately my own experience. Cause I have very, I'm te very telepathic, um, very, um, I've had some very weird episodes. I tend towards visionary experiences and I come from a theater background. So those, oh. Gebser actually comes from an art background too. He was a poet. And, and Steiner as well. Steiner was definitely highly artistic. And I think that that's where uh, they're very different from Wilbur, who's very cognizantric and very much into science as the, as the leader in this uh, in arts and morals. It definitely seemed he, he thought they were important, but that science was going to be taking the lead. So that's my two cents. I think that um, art, as our friend uh, Bonnie, Bonnie uh, Benita Roy, we know Benita Roy, uh, she said that um, the, uh, she criticized uh, Wilbur's way as, of working as well. And she mentioned that the apperspectival is artful, artful with a capital A. And I couldn't agree with her more. And I, I believe that's uh, one of the attractors that we have all had towards uh, the metapsychosis and, and cosmos. I think this is one of the, the drivers behind our, our get togethers is this, how do we put some flesh on this? Um, so I can say a whole lot more, but I'll, I'll just open up the floor to you guys. I'm like, very curious about your response. Is that how you do it? You can just, that, that's an excellent way to do it. You don't expect uh, anyone to say, oh, yeah, chime in. Uh, well, you I, know what, actually, I, I, just actually, Mark, before you do, uh, forgive the interruption, but I mean, I think one thing, just to be explicit, like one practice perhaps that we've cultivated here in the cafe 
for anybody else who's watching this, who may join or who may start their own cafes, is we do practice letting people say what they think, letting a thought get out. Like we want to, at least I want to see the full shape of your thought before I res respond to it. And maybe I don't have a response. Maybe I'm going to have a, take it something in a different direction. That's okay. But there's some sort of rhythm that we're learning. We haven't figured it out. The technology makes it a challenge because if we were in real space, meat space, we would be doing this more naturally. But I think one of the things we have to do, and maybe even a little bit extra deliberately, because we don't have the benefit of immediate body language and those kind of material feedback loops, uh, is let the thought get out. And then there's a sort of pregnant pause and then jump in, right? Then whoever jumps in takes it where they, you know, wherever it will go. But just to make something not as a rule, just an observation as to what I think works. I have a metaphor. It's like, uh, it's like jazz. Mm -hmm. It's um, improvised, a disciplined improvisation. Mm -hmm. And call and we response. Have little solos and then we join in, we give a little silence and then. Tap you all on the shoulder. That's my metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> and we, yeah, and that's a great metaphor. I love that metaphor. It's come so, up before as long, as well as the garden. Do, 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 do. <laughs> yes. The rhythm. Okay. I got rhythm, I got music. <laughs> Come on, Mark. Oh, I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> you got to keep the beat. <laughs> um, yeah, I, know I, think, feel I think one thing that I'm struggling with, and we talked about this Sunday, Marco, you and I, is what pay, are we talking about the evolution of consciousness within a person from birth to the to death, or are we talking about the, the species evolving generation by generation, sort of? And, and we we were talking about that, Marco, and and in the paper, Gidley's paper, she talks about Eric and stage development. Are we talking about a, a young baby stage one and then they get to say level or they're still in first tier, but they're at green and then, or, and then they can, if they, if they're really highly evolved, they can get really enlightened or are we talking about, the boomer generation, the millennial generation, the greatest generation, and then the hominids way back when. Are we talking about that kind of evolution or an individual, you know, getting more enlightened? That, that, that's a great question. Hmm. I think that's a very integral question. <laughs> I I have a thought on that. Um, I actually think this is where Wilbur is really good. And um, I would love to reply to a lot of things you've um, offered, John, uh, particularly because I have a different relationship with Wilbur and Wilberian thought and integralism. And, but let's come back to that. In this paper, to ground in the paper, Gidley does – differentiate between what she calls on not just she but ontogeny phylogeny and she adds mm -hmm. in an interesting dimension cosmogony uh, and in wilbur and in different ways uh gebster and steiner i don't think in the same exact terms but wilbur is explicit about this ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny and which recapitulates cosmogony so i think we're talking about both the both the individual's development uh, or evolution, if you will, uh, as well as what we might call social uh, collective uh, evolution. But there's another term we need to distinguish, and that's evolution and this other, this other term, development, because there are different dynamics involved, and they often get confused. We can talk about a person's evolution when what we really mean is development. Uh, 
or we could talk about social development where what we really mean is evolution. And I think that they're, what distinguishes them is this, that in development, there is a pre-established series of stages or phases or movements or waves or however you conceptualize the progression from one structure or stage to, to the next. From You're talking so, chi- childhood, school age. Piaget, up, you know, through yeah. post-formal. Uh, but there are also theories of social development, and those are perhaps more problematic even. Uh, but they're not necessarily unscientific. But the, 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 the distinguishing characteristic, I think, is that development implies a pre-established sequence. Whereas evolution, if I understand correctly, which is not, we don't know what the emergent is from an evolutionary process. It can't be predicted by the previous set right. of ingredients. Whereas a developmental process can be predicted. We know that the two-year-old is going to become, you know, with pre-operational cognition is going to become a, a seven-year-old with, with operational cognition and, and so on. And so Gidley is coming from this interesting place, I think, where she's a researcher in adult development, which are pre- those post-formal stages. Um, but she's also taking this macro historical and this um, comparative philosophical type of approach where she's looking at these varying perspectives on how that happens across, you know, vast stretches of time uh, with civilizations and, and you know, societies and, and groups. And, you know, there's a lot in this paper on that. Um, but where, where, I'm curious what, where your question is it, is it where, where, where might it be going? Is there, is that a prelude? Well, another thought? As we were talking Sunday and, and I don't think we agreed really, we were talking about, uh, I was saying that she's trying to push back modern man to 60,000 years as opposed to 40,000. And she's pushing back art and, and music and, and we, she, in her paper, you and I, arguing when did modern man emerge? And that's like biological evolution, you know, from ape to this to this. <clears throat> and at what, what point did we become, we humans become cognitively the way we are now? And, and I put it at, yeah, when you first start to see art emerge. And, and that's been the caves in, in France, the drawings. And she's saying, oh, no, we found a pebble over in Australia 20,000 years before that. So that's, that's one argument. And the other argument is... Yeah, is to use to use uh, some some people we know. Some people say Trump is a two-year-old, where Obama is a very highly. Let's John. Let's call these people smug. Can we call them smug? <laughs> so so, it, and when we talk about it, I think there's confusion at least for me, what you're talking, are you talking about the biological from ape model man, or are you talking about the individual in the stage developments? That I, I, I can respond to that, but I also want Ed to get in. Did you mm-hmm. want some? Are you ready to go for no, it? Just, just keep going. I'll, I'll get there. One I, I just don't feel comfortable till everyone right. has had a chance to voice them. Go okay. ahead. Uh, but I think there's a, I found it very problematic that uh, uh, something that a model that was very popular among the Wilberians was spiral dynamics, which comes out of Cohen and Beck. And um, there's an, and there, there were Cohen and Beck came out of somebody else. I can't remember. Claire Graves. Yes, Claire Graves. So it's Claire Graves, Cohen and Beck, and then uh, they, they formed something called spiral dynamics where they talked about, they color coded these different stages rather than calling saying archaic, magical, mythical, rational, they gave them different colors. And um, 
the the green was uh, the sensitive self or the the pluralistic um, the, uh, the 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 desire to preserve pluralism is very strong and that everyone gets included. Everyone gets a place at the table. This is sort of the impulse behind the green. But I think the mistake was, and it was made over and over and over again uh, by Wilbur, because he, um, he, he attributed that group of green, that good development to that kind of pluralistic uh, capacity to hold different perspectives, he tended to attack it as um, postmodernism, uh, the deficient forms of it. And I think, uh, so people are going around saying, oh, you're so sensitive, you're so inclusive, um, but you're also like, uh, you're against grand narratives. Um, and I think that kind of attack, attack dog mentality, is clearly not an integrated, comes out of an integrated uh, person. So I, I see this, these are two, two different branches of the integral movement. Um, I, I think of postmodern actually. I think Gidley was talking about how um, we see, um, we two, see these two different branches, the post-structuralists who are uh, criticizing Hegel and the cosmological uh, branch that is sort of aligned with Hegel. And I think this, uh, these two branches have all kinds of children, create all kinds of children. Um, so you see the, the postmodern, um, you see Deleuze and you see Derrida and you see uh, Heidegger, they all coming out of uh, this critique of Hegel. And you're seeing the, the, the Whiteheadians and those who are moving towards something more coherent, um, you see them in that, that cosmological sort of version. But you, you need both. You need the anti-Hegelians and you need the, the, uh, those who, who, are, who are moving towards Hegelianism. This is, I think, one of the arguments that she's putting forward here. Or maybe it's Hampson who's putting forward here. Anyway, that's my spiel, because I think that... Um, I think that those who are deconstructing, taking things apart, especially the universals that are not true, um, I think that's a very valuable function. And I think the postmodernists were, were really adept at that. They were wanting to preserve pluralism and they were against universalisms which constrain that. And uh, I think that there's, um, but that's all they were doing. And I think that's the problem. So I think the reconstructive side is when, once you've taken things apart, you gotta put things back together and put them back together in a more, in a way that stabilizes all of those ambiguities uh, that the deconstructivists have pointed out. Um, and that I think is where the schisms happened in, in Wilbur's world, because he was attacking the deconstruction without and trying to promote a reconstruction, but a reconstruction that did not preserve the pluralities that the, the postmodernists had, had very ably pointed out. So that's where I think it all got stalled. And, and I'm sorry, I, I, Mark, but you're, the, what I was trying to point out was that uh, a lot of people are calling other people green. This person's a green, a mean green meme. They're postmodern and we're integral. And that's bullshit. I just thought it was absolute bullshit. Um, and I, because I think it was like they were trying to claim we're going to reconstruct, you deconstructivists are bad, and that's not going to work. Individuals are not, cannot be divided up that way. Individuals are infinitely, infinitely more complex than anything spiral dynamics is going to come up with, with these, with these really simple color codes. <clears throat> you can't call anyone green. You can't call anyone red. You can't call anyone indigo or teal. These are abstractions and individuals um you have to look at individuals in a very different way so i think that's what we're the challenges that we're we're still confronted with is how do we you know when individuals come together and want to cohere in a we space uh how do we go about doing that uh, without um you know without these uh kind of turf wars frag fragmenting further 
um, or, and so I, I do think an improvise, a discipline, improvisational capacity is going to be very important. And I think that's uh, would be the hallmark of an integral person is that they can use visionary capacities and um, find the appropriate logics that support those visions, that visionary capacity. And <clears throat> I think we're a long way from there, that, but I think if we have this post-formal rational planetarization future, um, we can use our imaginations to move towards that. We can stop penalizing other people because they don't think the way that we do and start moving towards something a little more graceful and compassionate and artistic, you know, something more creative. So that's my spiel. I hope that made some sense. Ed, you want to jump in? Did you want to, if you wanted to say something, you raised your hand if you have something well, you I need. Just to. Want, I, I needed clarification. And what's confusing sometimes to everyone, when you mm. say we, we need to, mm. or is the we this group of really smart people that are, we're having a conversation? Or is we the human condition? I th I, when I use we, I usually mean the royal we, you know, with mm. the crown on the head. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all can use, use the word we the, any way you want to, but for me, sometimes I do mean, I, I do mean this group, the people I'm in, in conference with right now, and, um, but I could, you know, if I'm in a cafe and I'm sitting with another person and we're having coffee together, that's a we space. Well, if, um, if you It's different from you or I, a personal pronoun I, I'm pointing to myself and I, I'm telling you something uh, uh, from this perspective. Uh, but, that's different from you and I together. We form a we, and we could talk about another group over there, and they have a we, but it doesn't. But we're not in that group, so it's a boundary issue. I think it's very fuzzy. It's not clear well, to me at all. If we were in our cafe, in a real cafe, and a Bible thumper came in with a six shooter on his hip, <laughs> and you said to him, "We need to." Be more pluralistic. Are you talking about the human being as we? Or are you going, I'm integral and you are a fundamentalist? No, I, I'm not tolerant of people who are intolerant. I pull out my gun and I, I blow them away. <laughs> when they blow me that, away. That's why we need the shotgun in the cafe, Mark. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, no, I'm a, I'm a, I'm very prone to um, <coughs> anger and violence think, and primitive behavior if I'm up against it. If someone threatens me or threatens someone I love, I, you know, I will beat the shit well, out of. Them. I, I come think, from Texas. <laughs> well, I think I'm an older brother. I was beating the shit out of people since I was five I years think, old. So. I think that is common ground then between mm -hmm. you and the the fundamentalists. Mm. You know, he may have he he may have a six shooter, a revolver, and you may have a uh, Uzi. No, I would stop him. I would do whatever I could to stop that. That kind of stuff but, does but happen. No, I mean both. I mean, both and Orlando. Both it, that happened in Orlando. It happened in a bar over in the east, in the West Village, back in the, in the 80s. Someone came in with an Uzi and killed all these gay people. They just mowed them down. It was a black gay bar. These are the kind of things I was seeing and witnessing. Um, so. You, you answered know. my question. Yeah. So there's a we space. You're not, you're not and even though, even though people I've never met, like a lot of gay people, I would consider a part of a we, uh, my we space. Um, but there are a lot of, but that doesn't mean I'm, I'm um, separating people in, in gay or, or straight. Because I know a lot of straight people that I have much more in common with than, than I do with gay people. So I believe I, be, I believe that I belong to more than one group that could then be called a we, uh, that could a coherent we space, and I'm sure you do as well. Um, so we all we all have different affiliations with different kinds of groups and different kinds of identities, and, and we drop them when they're not convenient when uh, or when they make no sense. When we talk, and I'm going to include. Gidley and other people like that. When they say evolving consciousness, are they talking about the people on the earth now 
all getting sort of pluralistic, if you will, or are they talking about consciousness in the in the aggregate, all all people? In, in other words, can you? What I'm getting from you, John, is that you could educate a person and kind of pull them along to a more open, pluralistic, tolerant thing. That, that's a hope. You, you, you can have, do that, but not if they're aiming a rock at your head. No, of course. You stop but them. They have the capability. Yeah. Everybody now has... So when you speak of evolving consciousness, you're talking about individuals evolving their particular consciousness. You're not talking about the species having another level like telepathic or something. Oh, I think as, so. As a, as a, you know, all uh, 7 billion people all of a sudden making a leap Oh, we're able to communicate without, you know. No, I, I think that would be a nightmare scenario if we all were telepathic with everybody on the planet. Uh, and I think that would be something I would definitely resist. I mean, I think uh, well, wouldn't healthy, that, wouldn't that a healthy be magic would, be, would not be that. Healthy magical mind would be a participatory mind. You wouldn't recognizing that nature and self are, are very entangled, but that I wouldn't be... Um, but, you know, I can't read the minds of everyone on the planet. That would be very counterproductive. Well, uh, I need to be on, able to limit on, things to something I can make use of and make sense of. And knowing what everyone else is thinking would not be very evolutionary in my view. That would be uh, quite dangerous. I, I, all right. Oh, let's, let's, maybe we need some, let's hear from the Wisdom Council. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah, no, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I think uh, the question. Some I think you're getting at something, Mark. I, I don't think you're articulate. I think that there's some thing kind of unclear in your question, where uh, where it's coming from or it's angled. Maybe Ed, you have some clarity. Well, well, I want I wanted to pick up on on that. Um, God's, I I would I would be um, it, it would be too brash for me to say I understand what everybody is saying or asking, but. There, there was a point in our biological evolution, that we call that, where we were more ape-like and then we became more human-like. We, we kind of went from ape to human. And, and there's a qualitative difference between the two. There, there was some, something happened and, and whatever creatures were there were not like those that were there before. And I think what, what I think Steiner and Wil Wilbur and, and, and Dave Sir in particular are saying is that when that happened and there was such a thing as humans, um, they had a particular, a particular mode of consciousness. There was a way that they uh, dealt with and understood and engaged the world around them. And what, what I hear Gapes are saying for the most part, and this is specifically directed to, to Mark's question, it was qualitatively different than the way we do that today. I, I fully agree with him when he says there's a lot of question about when do we have the anatomically modern human being. And personally, I don't care. It, whether it was 40,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, or a million years ago, is so what? It's just irrelevant to me because it happened at some point and at some point we have to deal with it. And, it, and, and there are people who are interested in that and they pursue that and they'll, they'll, they'll do lots of research to try to pinpoint that. And I think that's great. And, and if that's helpful for understanding, well, how, do it, how is it that we deal with each other as what we consider to be human beings, then that's great. But I, I also believe very strongly, and I think this is the case that Gapeser makes, and this is why I, I particularly like from Gidley, that she simply used him as the framework and said, well, we'll use this because it's an easy orientation point because it's a very simple model. There's just, you know, there's five, 
structures in there, and they are qualitatively different from one another. We, we as human beings did not always perceive reality as we do today. That, that, that's, that's all that I think Gapeser has to say. And what he tries to document and what he tries to illustrate is, well, what might that have looked like or how might that have been or, and what kind of consequences might that have had for us as we've come along? And he, he suspects, and this was one of the things I found interesting in the, in the tail end of Gidley's paper, is where both Wilbur and Steiner were off into the future somewhere, projecting it could be this, that, or whatnot. Even, even Young in his model, he leaves it open and says, oh, it could be anything. We don't know where it's going. I don't, I don't think that mattered to Gapes or what, whatsoever. That, that wasn't a point of focus. He was just saying, it looks like, <clears throat> as far as I can tell from the evidence that I'm examining, that, that we're on a threshold of another qualitative leap, a step Otherwise, I don't even want to say forward or back. One thing that I, you know, Gapeser went to pains to to make clear is it's not stages, it's not sequential, it's not one after the other because it is it is predetermined that it is so. It is simply this is, and that's why he uses actually the word unfoldment. It unfolds this way. There's an increasing intensification of consciousness. And our, our perception and apperception of reality becomes ever more intense. And when, when I speak of we in that regard, I'm speaking about all human beings. Knowing full well of the 7 billion people on the planet, there are some people who are functioning, I'm going to say it, it's going to sound much more critical than I actually mean it to be, who are functioning at a very almost purely magical, what, what Gabe said, you could look at this and say, oh, well, they're, they're, look, they're perceiving the word magically. And these others over here, they're perceiving the word mythically. And they're perceiving the world mentally over here or mental rationally or whatever it is. And there are other people on our planet now, and I also believe that at all times, there have always been these differences there. But for the vast majority of the species, it was not that way. So these, these folks kind of stood out, and they were probably treated differently as well. But on the whole, in some kind of an aggregate, I don't know how big it is or how small it is. I don't think it can be empirically uh, grasped. Um, we, we have gone through these, these various stages, and it looks like it took this trajectory. And that's how I understand what he was saying. So, so it is a we, you know, there, there was a time when, um, when, our, when our, our, our ape cousins took full advantage of their opposable thumbs and started making tools, not just using things in their environment, but making them and taking them with them. That, that was a, like a, a, a huge leap forward so to speak, if forward is even the right word. I hate those words because they're so spatial. You know? But it was a huge leap, and it's a qualitative difference in what you do and how you deal with the reality around you. And that's, and that's the part, to me, that is most fascinating about what they're doing, what we're talking about, and what Gid Gidley is trying to point out. I think she bit off more than she could chew. That was, <laughs> that was, you know, that's why she has to keep saying, well, I don't have time to go into this, and I don't have time to go that. I don't have time to go into this, that's, and I can't really deal with that. Now, that's that's her favorite the scope expression. Of this paper, yeah. She yeah, I know it's beyond the scope of this paper because it is because yeah. you've got more than enough, I believe, and this is what I what I hear Mark keep saying: we have more than enough to deal with. Just deciding: are we talking about us as a species or us as individuals? Now, having said that. There does seem to be, and and that whole philo autogeny, philology, replication kind of thing fell into into great disrepute. I don't think it's I don't think it's absolutely true, but I think it's a handy tool in the way of looking at things. You know, just use it for what it's good for, and not anything else. You know, we've all seen pictures of the 
you know, the, the development of an embryo, and it looks like it goes through all the stages from from nothing to you know sea creatures and gill breathers up to you know with spines and legs and arms and whatever and upright. Okay, well, it kind of it goes that way, and we can kind of see those things, and it's helpful for us to remember. Well, we just didn't start out whole, and, and we're not whole now. We we haven't started. You know, we're just are where we are. So I get thrown into the world. And there are certain parallels between how a child is at two and in archaic thinking. And imagine I have a three-year-old here at home, and I'm I'm just delighted at how magical his world is. You know, I I I am very often just envious because I can't see his toys as alive as he does. And the things that they can do and say and think and what they what they want and motives that they have, but I believe that he's in tune with those. But then again, we, I live in a very magical region as well. This is this is where Grimm's fairy tales were all dug up. So we're a big fairy tale family in this house. We do lots of fairy tale, but that's a kind of except you know a way to access reality that is not necessarily my mental rational reality that I probably find myself in, uh, you know, 23 out of 24 hours a day. But I also intuit that, that there are other ways to do that. And if I can recapture some of that, if I can, and, and this is another thing that I think Gibbs says, and John mentions this again and again and again, his whole idea of re of integration was not, bringing together strands, it was like getting into yourself and fully realizing what's there. It was, it was a true, in, in, it's an inward journey that, that we go through where we actually bring all of those pieces of us together that we don't fully understand and grasp and use them in the most beneficial way for ourselves and whoever at that particular moment we are considering we. In addition to what's going on within the species, because I also think the species will make a change. It will do it biologically when necessary, and it will do it. And, and this is one of the, the the sticky points because, in the end, none of us have really said, "Well, what do I imagine consciousness to be?" But I, I, my understanding of consciousness is it's that other part of us. And it changes as well as our physical body does, perhaps more quickly or less quickly or more rapidly or more intensely. That could also be as well. I don't think they're on the same tracks. You know, that's why I'm not a big fan of like, cranial size or, or. Well, they both they both degenerate through time. Um, the mental and the part. physical. Okay. You mean lifetime? Yeah, in in uh, 120 years, that a uh, human being, that's the, the the lifespan. Yes. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yes. Okay. All right. Both that, the mind and the body. Individual. That's correct. Yes. Generally. Yes. 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 I have. But if, I, I think some people want to think that the mind keeps going. But and I and I think it does. Uh, and you were talking about this in no. one of the discussions, John. And I, it, 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 my father lived to be ninety six, mm-hmm. and his, you know, he was he was an amazing person at eighty, eighty five, mm-hmm. ninety, right, right about ninety. What happened? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he, he waved that finger yeah. too far and hit the button. <laughs> Just as he's get talking back. about his father's mental decline. I, I hope it comes back. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm um, sure I'll be back. Actually, let me do something quick because I had um, I had locked the room after <laughs> Susan. <laughs> I remembered that there is a feature where you could lock a room, and I realized maybe I should lock oh. the room so we don't get interrupted. Uh, all right, I've unlocked it. Maybe he'll make it back. <clears throat> I think I want. I, um, I think that might be a little bit of a diversion. Uh, what I think Mark was getting at, uh, for good or ill, because it's kind of treacherous terrain, <clears throat> is this notion of a distribution, 
a sort of evolutionary distribution. And the scope or what we're thinking of as where it, where it happens and what are the respective, um, what's the, the respective regard we ascribe to any given sort of subpopulation on that distribution. However you divide it up, because there's a lot of way of divide, ways of dividing that up. Um, we had met up on, Mark and I met up on, on Sunday just for a, a, a coffee. Uh, and he mentioned that he had been listening to, I think, a um, <coughs> Sam Harris podcast. Sam Harris is kind of latest dust up is this thing mm. with Hezra Klein um, around the work of um, the, the bell curve uh, fellow, Charles Murray, uh, mm. who wrote a piece for the New York, uh, an op-ed for the New York Times. Um, and, you know, they're looking at this, the science of it and, you know, uh, Sam Harris and Murray and people like Andrew Sullivan and others who are, you know, they're, you could say they're spiritually open uh, in various ways, but they're also pretty strongly rationalistic. <clears throat> they want to defend science. They want to just defend um, some kind of uh, liberal in the positive sense type of debate around evidence and going, you know, a, 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 an orientation around truth and the ability to have discourse, rational reason, reasonable discourse around the findings. Um, but of course, they're getting a, attacked uh, by the quote unquote pluralists and postmodernists who don't like, uh, you know, the political implications potentially of that kind of research, because, you know, it may disclose that certain groups test at um, a lower IQ than other groups. And then how do you account for that? Is it how much of its nature? How much of it is nurture? How much of it is environment? How much of it is history? How much of it is trauma? It really gets complex. And everybody is trying. The problem is, in my view, everybody's trying to reduce it down to one factor or another on this kind of mental landscape of categorizations. And they're not able to see the radical complexity and the radical inexhaustibility of the individual because no individual reduces down to a, a graph, to a chart. To, to a, so, I mean, this is just to bring in your, your, your point, John, as, as to like where evolution happens, where consciousness happens. It doesn't happen in the aggregate. It happens in actual concretion. I think this is what, this is Gebser's point. Nonetheless, from the mental scientific perspective, you can do research, you can use various kinds of tools and uh, statistical analysis to create these graphs of populations, which may show that according to some schema, some metric, some framework, some people are more evolved or developed, depending on how you look at it, than others. And what do you do with that information? Now, at that sort of level of the New York Times and, you know, the kind of mainstream, it's not even mainstream, I don't know what it, what it really is anymore, but that level of debate, it plays out <clears throat> along the axes of race and class and, you know, various other categories. In the integral world, in integral discourses, it plays out along the axes of, you know, structures of consciousness and color-coded developmental schemas. But fundamentally, it's the same kind of a thing. And I think the question, what Mark may be pointing at, um, is that tension, uh, you know, Wilbur and his, you know, crew of which I was a part and still, you know, have a kind of influence and lineage, we call it a vertical tension. Uh, there's a tension because there's differentials in, and there's asymmetries in not only kind of developmental progress, which is very natural, a child is naturally a child and grows naturally into an adult, but potentially also within societies where pe pe amongst people, some people grow more in some ways than others do. And yet they all have to coexist on the same planet. Um, and, you know, I think ultimately through some shared mutually, uh, you know, optimal or optimized uh, political and governance systems and economics and so forth. And we're, and the debate is about how to, how to sort that out. Uh, because, you know, when you look, obviously historically it's fraught and bloody and we're still dealing with the consequences of all kinds of misuses of knowledge 
uh, misuses of perspectives. <coughs> so what, what I think Gidley's contribution here is to very carefully um, tease out what, you know, what the terminology is, who's saying what, what they might mean, how it corresponds, where one is stronger than the other. A lot I could say about Wilbur and um, the, you know, deficiencies of that approach and the strengths of that approach. I mean, I think for what Wilbur offers, cognoscentrically, uh, very strong. And he offers, Gidley uses a really nice metaphor. She, she distinguishes between what she calls the, the map, the territory, and the guide. And she uh, connects or associates uh, the territory with Steiner, because Steiner was so, and I'm just learning about Steiner now, but so um, uh, prolific, you know, in his investigations, in his actual experiential explorations of this this territory of different states of consciousness, different access, different modes of access, modes of knowledge, and so forth. Gapser, the guide. Uh, who, in his text, and I agree with her assessment, really takes you into, takes you in, in the journey. He takes you on the journey of consciousness unfolding. And you really can phenomenologically experience it by reading the text. A, not everybody can do that. Not every writer can do that. Wilbur doesn't exactly do that because his role is more of the map maker. He describes describes the territory hey. without hey, Mark. Necessarily... welcome back hey, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> i'm just going to finish this thought he describes the territory wilbur without necessarily taking you there but then he'll describe the various injunctions and the things that different people have done to yeah. access the, the territory uh and so that's why you get these high level kind of abstract maps that correlate different approaches from you know different schools and disciplines and he does the best that he can i think at doing that and I think that as far as that goes, he's actually clearer and more comprehensive, certainly more accessible than Gebser, Steiner, and probably Aurobindo and others. But he also has the benefit of coming later, coming after the postmodern turn, coming after the, um, you know, the 1960s and the, the revolutions in consciousness that Ge Gebser was just attuning to in the 40s. He was feeling it coming, and then it came. Wilbur came of age during this explosion of the aperspectival, but Wilbur in his own personal evolution or growth or however you want to think about it as a thinker, and as a writer, he kind of skipped that whole movement, really. I mean, he was around it, he was part of it, but he went into the sciences uh, relatively young and became a writer out of becoming being a scientist at first. So he was doing his PhD in... Um, biology and he was working on uh did his thesis was working on a thesis on vision so the the biology of vision and then at the same time reading buddhism and vedanta and so forth and engaging in meditation practice and and really you know developing his own uh consciousness but he skipped green he skipped that revolution he bypassed it and that's why he it didn't bypass it, though. <laughs> he didn't go through it, so he did not bypass it. <clears throat> I think he's. I think that's false. I'm just. I'm jumping on you now. Well, let me let me, fi let me finish. And there's and false. Back. And there's neither true nor false. And there's. But I think there is a true and a false. And I don't think he went. Um, I think I. I'll back off and let you finish. I didn't okay, mean. Okay. Okay. Sure. I mean, I. Uh, by I mean bypass, kind of in the sense that people talk about spiritual bypass. Yeah, that's like, yes. yes. But you can't skip magical and just go to rational. You no, can't skip no, mythic. I'm, you no, can't I'm not, I'm, go through no. it. You can't say you bypassed it. <laughs> no, I'm saying that he did not really personally go through the cultural revolution or changes that we would associate with the more pluralistic, the more multicultural. And he developed an I would think, I would say some Who are you talking reaction, about? reactivity, Ken Wilbur. a reactivity to, uh, against it, partly because he was really experiencing some of the deficient downsides of it, which is the, the kind of, because, you know, the, 
if we accept that these sta- these structures emerge, they also emerge in a way that has to define themselves against what already is there. So it's a th- that's why the the sixties is a kind of revolutionary reaction against the conservatism of you know of of the mo- of the modern uh, culture you know up until that point, and Wilbur's reacting against that in his philosophy, uh, and I think what. Gidley is doing here is bringing back in the virtues, the values, the sensitivities of the participatory and the aesthetic dimensions, which are more fleshed out in the postmodern uh, that Wilbur rejects and attacks. And I, and I think that that's one of the, um, you know, I, I can see why. I can see why. But I think that we have to move beyond it, and we are. And that's part of what I so appreciate, I appreciate about Gidley's paper is that she is going for a, a wider embrace. She's trying to find, she's trying to practice this critical reverence, appreciate the gifts that come through Gebser, through Steiner, through Wilbur, through a number of other thinkers she mentions. Edgar Moran is a very interesting one, wrote a book called Homeland Earth. Um, and how can we... I mean, the, this the to re, you know return to the top the top the title of the paper. Uh, it's a the evolution of consciousness as a planetary imperative. What does that mean? If our context is this planetary planetary stage, this scene, this Earth that we have to share, and we have to face the the fact that there are these d- differentiations, these asymmetries, the historical trauma and dimension. And the fact that also not everybody agrees with that view. Not everybody agrees that we should stay on planet Earth or that planet Earth is even salvageable as as an idea. Uh, It's a very complex situation. And I think that we're thinking through it. Um, But it's, uh, it's, uh, we may be biting off more than we can chew. Um, Well, you you, you said so much, Marco, that, um, triggers a response, but I'm wanting to hear the rest of your story, Mark. You were talking about your father in the yeah. night, <laughs> the 90s, and then all of a sudden you disappeared. It was Maybe like that. We could, bring, we could bring it back in. You could, you could finish that um, that that story because I want to hear, it. and then I wanted to respond to what you were responding to too. I I was just making the point that that. Physically and mentally, as we are now, humans, that we go through these stages, and and the end is is uh, not pleasant. No, it's not. It's it's uh, and uh, you know, uh, my father was a remarkable person, and he lived a very long time. But he would not have lived that long without modern medicine and technology, and he had he had the very best of care, like a five star place that he was in. Uh, and we we can talk about that, but but not here and and now. It's just that the end is the end isn't great. And and I it, 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 for different individuals, you know, I'm past my prime, mentally and and physically. Uh, I think for me personally, and I think it could be generalized to to the male, is I probably peaked, and I'm not 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 a professional athlete, but mm. but I I probably <coughs> peaked in my mid fifties. You know, I was, I could still do pretty damn much anything. And, and mentally I was really sharp and, and, you know, the mind is starting to go and the body is a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who you telling that though? <laughs> and, and, and yeah. that was the point I, I, that was the point I was making about, I don't, the, you know, evolution of consciousness. Well, 
it get you know you start at zero you know you pop out of the womb and you go through these stages but it does it it mentally you peak also it doesn't keep going although some people you know think whoa you know <laughs> they die in the mind and the kind of heaven or however you know whoever wants to whatever but there's no evidence really of anything scientifically uh there's some you know some anecdotal stuff but uh, so that was did you want to respond ed did anyone else want to no, no 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 uh, i i have a th thank you for sharing that mark i mean i've had um i think though that uh senescent i think is senescent phase like you look at a plant and you can tell if the plant is a young plant a mature plant or a, in the senescent phase where it's heading towards the compost heap. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can see this in a plant. You can also, there are some who are saying that you can see this in a city. Uh, you can see it in a group. Um, you can tell when, or, or a family, it's a young family or it's a senescent family. Um, so I'm just, but I think the, um, there are individual, uh, I think the individual and the species are on a different level. I think the species is, is abstract and unembodied. And I'm in the physical. I have a first per person pronoun I. I tell stories. I persuade others. I am persuaded by others. We affiliate or disaffiliate. I make decisions and I suffer. The species isn't doing any of that. I am. And so are you. And we get old and we die. The species may or may not die because I don't know if the species ever lived. It's, an, it's a higher level abstraction. But I do think that's very important when we're talking about evolution. Uh, and when we're talking about biological evolution and cultural evolution, because culturally, and I believe the case can be made that culture trumps biology. What I eat, what I wear, who I affiliate with, um, the businesses I start up, the way I use the environment, all of that will change my genetic code. Um, that's something that Darwin didn't know anything about, really. He knew nothing about the bi microbi microbes. And the more we learn, I think it's becoming clear that the microbial world is, is as smart, if not smarter than we are. Bacteria, when we're long gone, our species, bacteria will still be here. <laughs> so, and we couldn't live a day without, without that, certain kinds of bacteria. Um, so I think that the whole idea of what the species is, is getting much fuzzier than it was. Um, getting much what? Fuzzier. Oh. Um, because there's a, a, there's a lot more going on to us. Uh, I, 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 the microbial world, bacteria, the biome, the, the biotic. Uh, we're in an environment. So brains and DNA and organisms are environments that are constantly shifting and moving around. So I think with the, we were talking previously in our, in our discussion, uh, I think last week about Crick and Watson and that top-down model they have for the DNA, that the DNA calls all the shots, basically. And that's been called into question. Um, and I think that uh, I, I, I'm much, so I think that relationship between biology and culture, they need to be differentiated, can't be separated, but I think you can't uh, reduce one to the other. Um, and, and so that, that question about uh, what's doing the evolution is a very, very uh, complex one, actually. Uh, but I think that, and also I just wanted to, I was listening to a mathematician, Lou Kaufman. He was talking about knots. He's a real, uh, he's a genius when it comes to mathematics and to, to geometry and to topology. And he was talking about the knot. You can tie a knot in a rope. And there's a pattern that's created. Uh, and he was asked, well, in the real, but he said, that's not the rope. The rope is not the knot. Uh, the knot happens in the, in the, in the particular rope but you can't reduce the knot to the rope. Um, and someone asked, well, where is the knot? What is the relationship of the knot to the real world? 
And he said uh, that that pattern for a mathematician is in the real world. Um, and in, the, in mathematics, which is the play of um, quantities, that, that pattern, which is uh, different from the rope, is what they play with. And I think that's a lot, that to me is sort of similar to what a species and a organism are. Um, but, but I think there's an interplay between these uh, very high abstract patterns and being embedded in, in the matrix. And I think that uh, we are very, we and I and you and we and us, we use storytelling, metaphor, our imaginations to move towards something that we want to have happen. That's our personal agency. And we have to protect that and preserve it because there are lots of nefarious forces out there that want to take it away from you. And I think postmodernism, for all of its goodness in exposing, uh, you know, trying to preserve pluralism and exposing those top down universals, uh, did not go through a reconstructive phase. And as it, and I think that's what's happening now. And because we're starting to realize that personal sense of agency, the will, I have hands, I'm going to go out and make something, I'm going to change something, I'm, I'm going to manipulate. Those are the kind of things that that personal sense of agency will uh, can activate um, these kinds of uh, interplays between these different dimensions. So I think that's what's happening is we, we, we need to really start to um, develop a sense of agency. And I see it evaporating over large sections of people. <laughs> I mean, I think this technology for all of its blessings and is bringing us here today, I hope we can use this technology in, in a different way. And I think this is a mission that, that many of us have tried to articulate. Um, um, and I think that my, my, my main thing, I keep asking people, what do you want to have happen? I've asked that to so many people and they look at me with a blank stare. They've deconstructed everything. But when you ask them what they want, they don't know. <laughs> no one's ever asked them that. And, that, and I, it takes a little bit of practice to say, gee, well, what do I want? <clears throat> what do I want to have happen? And, it, and I think that's when the visionary, the future oriented, the active, the personal sense of identity starts to become a creative force in the real world. So I hope we can do more of that and I hope we can do it better. And we've been doing it here. Uh, instead of dissecting the problem and taking the problem apart and then uh, hoping for a solution, which usually maintains the problem. It just, uh, the, the solution becomes a variation upon that problem because it's at the level of the problem. What do you want to have happen creates a desired outcome. And that's a very different uh, that's a very different game you're playing than if you're just trying to solve problems or deconstruct problems. So anyway, I, I hope that made sense. <laughs> Thank you guys for giving me a chance to rehearse this. <laughs> this is an improv. I'm making it up mm -hmm. as I go along, but I hope it has some discipline as well. And what would you like to have happen now, John? Um, right now, after all that we've said, mm -hmm. what, what I would like to have happen now in this session, well, it's happening. Um, I think when I look back on this, if I get a chance to look at the video, I think that slow mind, um, that self-reflexive capacity, um, will give, be given an opportunity to, uh, enter into this, uh, free-for-all that's going on now. This is in the moment and it's, um, we're saying things that we didn't plan to say. And I'm hearing things and only probably missing a great deal. But I think that's the value in, uh, of, of when you post these talks. And I really appreciate that you, you're posting them promptly rather than three or four days after the event. You're, you've been posting them promptly. That's great because that allows me, my slow mind, to start getting active. So that's why I think these this is how we could use this technology in very interesting and innovative ways. 
is we can have these free for alls in the moment. And um, then we can look, we have an archive so we can uh, observe uh, ourselves in the group and what was missed and what can be reflected on. And then we can feed that back into the group. And that isn't something that we could do without this technology. I mean, we could we could kind of hang out in a bar and meet some people who are who are nice people, and we could have a political chat. But as soon as we leave that bar, it would probably be erased very quickly from anybody's memory. Um, but now that we have this technology, for good or ill, <clears throat> but I hope we can use this technology. That's my desired outcome: that we can use this ter- technology to create a learning curve rather than um, ev- uh, lose get so distracted that we lose our sense of personal agency, personal responsibility, and um, stop functioning in in an innovative and creative way, but start to regress and become manipulated by those who wanna turn you into a house slave, because that's what they want to do. And it looks like right now Uh, they're being- What? A house what? A house slave. Oh, a house slave. Yes. I think that's where our, that's where our economy is going. And I think this is where, to go back to what you're talking about, Wilbur, and I think this is Wilbur's error and why I don't think he went through uh, or bypassed Green. He didn't deal at all with the objections that Green had about. He wanted to uh, preserve what he thought were the benefits of capitalism and modify capitalism. And I think he was wrong. I don't think you can modify capitalism. It doesn't recognize, it's the nature of capitalism not to recognize any limits upon itself. So he, he, he could have said socialism, but he didn't. So basically he joined the neoliberal bandwagon and, uh, you know, and they were talking about, you know, Clinton and Obama. Obama was the first integral president, which I do not believe is true. And I think that's where uh, Wilbur really had a, a blind spot and he's a, I, I think he's a marvelous man and I, a good person and a brilliant theorist, but I think that blind spot was uh, really prevented the organization from cohering and being effective. And when I left that, this is, in two, this is right when the downturn happened in the economy. And uh, it, it just struck me that everybody in, that, in the so-called third tier were as clueless as everybody else <laughs> about what to do. And a lot of the, and that's when I think before all the scandals that hit Cohen and basically just wiped out all of that. Um, anyway, that's my two cents. And that was my response to both of you gentlemen. So thank you for giving me the, 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 the space to put all of this together. It's not easy. I, I think I, I, I see your hand, Mark, but uh, Ed hasn't said quite as much. And I, I, I would... I, I am quite, I'm curious. We haven't touched on this much. We talked a bit about Wilbur, talked a bit about Gebser. We haven't talked about Steiner. And um, he, for me, is new. I've, I'm aware of him. I've read maybe, you know, a few pages back when. Can't even remember. Uh, they're holding some books at used, um, not, not used book emporium, but uh, barbed wire books downtown, uh, Cosmic Memory, a couple of others. So I'm looking forward to, to well, <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to um, picking that up. But Ed, you have more of a history with Steiner. And I wonder if you might, you know, out of, you know, in, to honor Gidley's contribution here and mm-hmm. bring the conversation back to her, her text, especially since we're kind of at the latter part of this talk. Um, what are your reflections on the role that Rudolf Steiner uh, might play in this integration of integrals uh, that Gidley is describing here? See, it would be nice if you just once asked an easy question, Michael. But um, Steiner, Steiner is, uh, it's not like I have a history with Steiner. Um, I was exposed to him because we had, when I taught school here in Germany, uh, it was a boarding school. And so a lot of times uh, we would have children who were going to be transitioned back into the, to the, the state school system. And 
we were kind of a halfway house because we were part of the reform pedagogy, the reformed pedagogical approach that had been in, introduced at the turn of the 20th century. It is a kind of a more holistic education. Um, we were state approved, so we our curriculum was was pretty standard. But the way we went about doing it was not was not um, not like you would find in a in a in a public school somewhere, since it was um, uh, a boarding school. So these these kids would come to us, and and you get into talks with their parents, and their parents were all very much uh, enamored by and. And, and taken by the Steinerian idea of of what a, what a human being is, and and I think that's at the root of everything else. Because uh, one of the things, and I think Gidley does a, a, an excellent job of this, um, bringing across that being a human is much more involved and much more complex than any of us like to imagine. And even those of us who like to think that we're thinking very encompassing and embracing and, 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 and far reaching and whatnot. Um, we're just making little baby steps. Steiner had this re- really cosmological, he had a cosmological view of the human and it is completely informed by the entire cosmos. And it's, and, th- and that's what makes it very difficult to, to come to terms with Steiner because, um, He developed what he called the spiritual science. And, and what it is, I think, in simplest terms, and, and John can relate to this, there is a, there's a certain amount of clairvoyance. He saw things that the rest of us don't even imagine exist. But for him, they were facts. They were, that was just, just the way things are. And he tried the best that he could to describe those. And Gidley's great service that she does here is she takes a lot of that that esotericism out of this. There's a, um, it's it's really easy to push um, Steiner off into the esoteric corner, um, where he's in with the rest of the theosophists and spiritualistic mediums and this that and whatnot, and nothing could be further from the truth when it comes to the man. But he does talk about things in a way that is very very difficult for we in the at the at the beginning of the 21st century to come to terms with. Um, we don't we don't look at us as a human being and say we're composed of 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 four or five bodies. We have one physical body, that's it, and we've got a consciousness or a mind or something that operates in that body. But it's basically tied to that body, and that's it. And in in Steiner's world, there are five bodies. Well, actually, there's nine bodies altogether. But just talking about it's where we are now. You, we could start with three, you know, and so there's a physical body, there's an uh, etheric body, that's what we would call a life body, an astral body, which is an emotional body, and these are actual bodies for you. These are coherent, sustainable entities, if you will, in that sense, being, and and they, when the physical body goes away, these still remain, and after a while, the etheric goes away, the astral is there, and then and he goes on to these these others, and they're all part. They're all part of who we are individually, but who we are individually doesn't matter, because we're all part of something greater than ourselves. And our task when we're here, this is one of the things that that he brings out. That's why we go through these evolutionary stages and these developmental stages, is to is to develop each one of these bodies as we go along. We, we, we have developmental tasks that we have to take care of, just like you know, a child has to learn to go from pre-formal to formal to post-formal operation. You know, those are the things that we do, and they have to learn how to, to walk and to run and to jump and to compete and to do other things, and then later figure out, oh, well, my prime was in the 50s. Um, I hit mine way before that, um, <laughs> for example. But... But, but those are all part of, of what we do as we go through the, the incarnation that we're in. And, and, and you can see now I'm talking about things that for a lot of people are just like, okay, well, forget it. You know, we, you know we're born once, we die, that's it. Uh, there's, you get one shot. And Steiner will 
you know, a, a, a large part of what he, what he talks about is that, you know, we have always been and always will be. And so we take on these different forms and manifestations of that. And those manifestations are in part physical. But prior to this, this incarnation, they were not physical. Now we're in a very physical incarnation. But he projects out into, you know, what he sees as the future, which is certainly not linear, you know, if, if I could, could say that, um, where it becomes increasingly non-physical. So what he, what he has to say needs to be looked at and thought about with a very open mind because I guess you could say a lot of what he says could be understood symbolically rather than literally. It's real, really difficult when we get to the literal part and the figurative part and the, and the symbolic part of all of this. Uh, we do all of this when we're saying, and, and, and we, we know from, from art and from the history of art, for example, that the symbol, there are certain motifs that just keep appearing and appearing and appearing. They, they won't go away. And every artist that, you know, is worth his salt addresses them and, and, and tries to express them in some way or, you know, to, to reflect, well, I, I just tapped into to something. And, you know, and that's why we keep seeing them. And they're very powerful things. And I personally, because I'm still trying to figure all of this out, I don't know what to do with that all of the time. But Steiner provides a very clear Giddley points out it's difficult to access simply because he wrote in the uh, uh, beginning of the 20th century German. And we know how difficult it is to read the beginning of the 20th century English. So there's nobody that's sitting down translating this into a modern idiom for us. We actually have to work through it. And he's addressing things that, that are generally not on the empiricist's um, screen. And, and that, that makes it difficult, okay? Because for him, they are empirically present. But for me, they're not. But, but there are, that doesn't mean that, when John relates a lot of his, um, his experiences that he has, for example. My weird experiences. <laughs> you said weird, John. I didn't, because I don't think they're weird. Say, I don't think they're weird at all. I think they're, ex they're exceedingly normal. And, but they're not things that all of us experience every day. But we experience them. And, and somehow we have to come to terms with them and learn to explain them. I have one of my, I don't have these often, believe me, John. Let me just relate one small experience. Please. I had, a, I had a drive to work in Silicon Valley. I had to go through 16 stoplights to get there. And it was for me always, okay, when do I get the green wave? When do I just go through that? I don't get any red lights and I can drive from my house to my place of work. If I did that, it would take 16 minutes. And I, remember, and I always left very early in the morning because um, in Silicon Valley, if you didn't, I had got up at a quarter after four every morning the whole time that I was there so that I could be at work basically by 5.30 at the latest. Because if I didn't, it would take me an hour to get to work. Not, we weren't talking about 16 minutes. We weren't talking about 20 minutes or half an hour. We're talking now orders of magnitude. more. But I had to go past the post office. And so in that one morning, I said, okay, well, I'm going to go by and I'll drop my, uh, I'll drop my, um, my letters in the mailbox. Well, I'm driving down the road, and I learned a long, long time ago, there's, we have a still small voice, and when mine speaks, he doesn't speak often. He's, he's probably lazier than I am as old. But when he speaks, I listen. And I'm driving down the road, and I come to the first light, and it's green. This is to go across the street to the post office. And the little voice says, stop. Okay. <laughs> Put on the brakes. So I stopped in front of the green light when a pickup truck flew, literally, through the intersection. It was not on the ground. All four wheels were off the ground. This guy was in a hurry. <laughs> Came. Watch the truck. You go, oh, thank you. Wait for the light to change, because <laughs> in the meantime, it had turned red, and you drive across. Now, I don't know of any scientific 
theory, so to speak, according to our, you know, how we go about this one, that explains why that should be. It was a, it's a very real experience. It's not the first time. That's the only thing, by the way, this little voice that got me through the military without being court-martialed or thrown out. When the voice said, go ahead, I did. When it said, don't, all right, I'll shut up. So my little voice got me through. But that's as about as far as it goes. I don't have a lot of those other things that I think we have access to. Well, how do you explain that? And when I when I listen or read a lot of things that Steiner said and others similar to what he's done, he's he's probably the most coherent and the most cogent and probably the most to the point. That that's the thing I like about him more than anything else. Than the others do. I I find um, let's say mechanisms and metaphors that I can use to help come to terms with those kinds of things because it just shouldn't be. But I know that they're there and we have those. And and this is the value that Steiner has. And I'm exceedingly thankful that Gitli was was willing to pick that up and say, well, I'm going to tr- present this. And that's what she does do. She presents this in a way that makes it palatable. I'm, I'm sure if anybody who gets inspired by that from, let's say, the less non-physically inclined of her colleagues starts looking into it, they're probably going to beat feet for higher ground. But at least she presented it in a way that you are open enough to at least have approached it. And that's and that's an, a very important thing to say because there's just there's too many things that he addresses and speaks of really hard to understand that we're the evolution of the earth that we've gone through the Jupiter phase and, the, and you know, as real planets and the, the anthroposophists also believe that the planets are beings and things like that. So, you know, that, that's just all booga booga. Ooh, what are we going to do? Um, but, but there's a certain, there's a certain sense to it. If it's taken in the, in the, 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 the overall context of there may be more on heaven and earth than we dream of in our own philosophies. And that, and it's being, oh, open enough to that to at least to at least let him have his say, regardless of how it is you want to deal with it. It's, I think, a very important uh, a step in, in a very important direction that we've uh, long overlooked. And that's why, and I was also very, and in that, you know, that same vein, Hampson, you know, that impressed me about his, uh, his reviews. He talks about hermeticism as if it were normal. You know, doesn't even bat an eye just walks right through it. But, you know, in a lot of places, that'll get you thrown out of academia you know, or prevent you from getting tenure. You know, that, that's starting to open up. So, you know, I think St- you have to take Steiner with a, with, a, with a certain amount of skepticism, but at the same time, openness, because he is simply talking about things that we normally don't talk about, I think. That's my... Well, Not so concise, but concise. Well, I, I would just add I mean, to pick up. I don't have a lot to say more on this, but it seems to me uh, that there's also something of a movement in contemporary philosophy or contemporary metaphysics to uh, rethink our sort of epistemology uh, and mm-hmm. what we consider to be real, so that yeah. at the very at, at your basic level you're not discounting any phenomena at all. That sort of radical empiricism. Um, it gets interpreted in different ways. I've heard of speculative realism. J.F. Uh, Martel uh, posted to the forum his podcast, Weird, Weird Studies. They did an episode on what they call object-oriented ontology. Um, I'd love to come back to that at some point, but one of the implications of that kind of metaphysics is that it is open, I think, in principle. Uh, I disagree, actually, with... I have some beef with object-oriented ontology, but in principle, I think you can make the case that anything you might experience, like your little inner voice, you know, from that to, you know, the full blast, you know, demonic entities and, you know, all kinds of... like you can see them as objects like any other objects and viewed through that lens, which again, I I think has issues. I want to come back to that, but um, it does open up the possibility to re-examine or to take a fresh look 
like maybe what we thought was totally illegitimate, you know, was not allowed in the realm of knowledge or the realm of um, you know, proper discourse. Uh, maybe, maybe we have, have a way of talking about that and even a way, you know, of experiencing uh, some of those approaching perhaps those objects uh, that we had been overlooking. So I think that there is an opening actually. I, I agree, uh, not to interrupt, but I, I think that is the real value of Kelly and his co-workers uh, approach that um, we looked at in the irreducible mind. Mm -hmm. Going back to Myers, simply let's, let, let's take another look at this. You know, maybe there's another way to approach this. You know, like I said, I happen to think it's one way, but I also can't explain it for myself as, all the time. And I, and I find other people that have said, okay, well, why don't we look at it this way or we can maybe look at it like this. Um, I'm, I've, I've been very um, in, inspired by a lot of the things that we've read and, and uh, Gidley brings it up as well. I need to go back and take another look at James. You know, he's just, he, he just keeps coming up. He had a whole different idea in mind that he wanted to pursue that, that got cut off, so to speak. And I, you know, I appreciate that a lot of these folks are now bringing this up because I do believe that we can explain things sooner or later to all of our satisfactions if we're open enough and willing, willing to pursue it. Not that just one little throw that in, but I, I think we're doing that kind of thing. I, I could, I could add something there if I may. Zachary, hi Zach, welcome aboard. Hi, um, hi everybody. Um, I just wanted to respond to, um, I think Steiner was a very polyphasic kind of guy. He was very, and he was living in a very monophasic world, as we are. I mean, he, positivism was in its heyday. We're sort of in the, the aftermath of that. Even the positivists don't, aren't positivists anymore, but in, in, in those days they were. And, um, but I think he was, um, he was able to coordinate, I guess nowadays we would call, talk about brain waves, about beta, theta, delta, alpha. And um, he, I believe, was very adept at begin, going from alpha to theta. <coughs> and he was often would go into a trance around other people. Someone would bring an issue to him, he would just go into a corner and close his eyes. Uh, sometimes his eyes would be open, but they would be, he would be in another world <clears throat> and he could report, give them certain um, information that, you know, he was calling, you know, about their karma. So he would phrase things in a certain way. Um, so I think he, he was, I think, a real masterful at these altered states of consciousness. And he was able to um, find a vernacular that made sense of the people around him. He was very uh, Christ conscious. He was into Christ consciousness. Uh, he did. He was interested in the Buddha. He wasn't interested that much in Buddhism, though. But he he did have a, a lot to say about the Buddha, and it does seem to be that he had a capacity for entering into these imaginal realms, and he could, you know, report about the the levels of the development of the persons who were living in the age of when when Jesus was alive, and he could, um, and he could go back into the Paleolithic times and report on what the environments were like. And this is, he wasn't just using, if this wasn't just a fantasy prone individual, this is someone who could enter into the objective imaginal realms, what some people call the Akashic. And um, I also believe I, that another thing he had, he, he was able to, um, Benedictor talks about late postmodernism, how uh, Leotard and Derrida and uh, Foucault, right when they're getting ready to croak, <laughs> right when they're on the, at the edge of death, they start to go, aha, you know? Um, and they start to realize that personal sense of agency. Um, but in, who wants to wade through all that late stage postmodernism to get to the care of the soul, you know? Foucault in the last six months of his life started to pay attention to that sort, sort of stuff. But I think he, uh, Benedict calls, uh, he, he quotes Leotard as talking about the eroticism of the will. 
And uh, in other words, I think that personal sense of agency, I think that's an unfortunate description, but I sort of get what he means. And that personal sense of agency, that eroticism of the will, I think that's something that um, uh, Steiner had in spades. I mean, he was deeply involved in um, the will and the use of the hands and the coordination of that of what you want and making it. And uh, that's why he was, he was in biodynamics and organic farming came out of his research and he was an architect. He was also a form of dance he created. Um, so he was a man of the theater, he wrote plays. So I think that's where I, I, I find um, a lot of inspiration from Steiner. And yeah, I'm going to a Steiner group tonight. Um, there's a, a Steiner uh, meditation group that I've just started to become interested in. And I spoke to the man who runs that group and they also do read, they read Steiner's text and they also read Barfield, Owen Barfield. So I thought that might be fun to do a little bit of research and get to know that community that still they're still operating. So anyway, thank you guys. This has been very helpful for me. I just want to, one more thing I just wanted to, I think uh, Gidley has a desired outcome and it's her last paragraph. And I think I can say this is a desired outcome because there's, the, there's no problem she's trying to solve in this statement. The most important development that needs to occur at this point in planetary time is for all of us who are working in our various ways to nurture post-formal, integral, or planetary consciousness, to continue and increase our collaboration to assist the planet-wide awakening of emergent new features of consciousness. I think that's an excellent desired outcome. Here, here. One bit of trivia I picked up, I don't know if it was in this paper or another, but uh, Steiner had visited Nietzsche. Uh, yeah, when yes, he was that's true. And was uh, helping to take care of some of his texts or manuscripts. He's organized the archives. Yeah. yeah um, and it's it really interesting that in a lot of ways, Nietzsche be, became kind of the central figure for this post-structuralist, post-modern mm -hmm. you know, move. Uh, but there was Steiner the you know at the at the at the source of it he kind of gets overlooked by that that whole branch um i don't know what to make of it but it, it, he, he he thought he thought nietzsche was um very ungrounded that he had not incarnated fully that he was very it sounds to me to, to that he had that nietzsche was extremely highly cognitively advanced and i think that's what steiner was reading steiner also was a student of get goethe so I think there's that, that Schelling, Goethe, um, that idealist streak. He, he, he sort of embodied that. He, and he, I think you mentioned that, that he thought he was the reincarnation of Goethe. So I think he was in that reconstructed phase rather than the Nietzschean deconstructed phase. I think those are but the- But he got ones. along with Nietzsche very well. And, and it's, that does come out in the foot, one of the footnotes in there that, uh, you know, he he had a, a particular understanding of, of Nietzsche, and it would, be, I, it would be interesting for those who have you know read a little Nietzsche and think they know something about Nietzsche to to look at what that connection might be. Mm. It might be tr difficult digging it out of the uh, Steinerian archives and the texts wherever, but I'm I'm sure that he 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 said more than one thing about it. it would it would be interesting to follow up on. Another bit of trivia, uh, mm -hmm. Steiner was in the midst of completing a big architectural project called the yeah. Gothenium. Yeah. I don't know what, uh, what city that was, but that was just before the war. Yes. Uh, and he was for, he had to flee um, yeah. before being captured or killed, whatever was going to happen. And then the whole project was destroyed. And this was yeah. a, you know, a great personal tragedy that some ascribe to his deterioration yeah. and his, and his uh, untimely death. Uh, I think in his early 60s. So maybe even, you know, at his own peak, if you will, mm -hmm. or even prior to it. Uh, so very interesting and rich history. Yes. Uh, yeah, he, he did, he did, they did rebuild the Gotenaeum. I, I, I heard recently, not a, I heard he died when he was 64 and, and they yeah. said, I'm just looking at, um, I just heard a bio. Um, 
Gary Lockman's bio on, on Rupert Steiner, and it, they they said his he he died very mysteriously. There was like six months where he was like in bed and couldn't move, and he died. And they don't even know what the disease was. And there's I heard some speculation that he had been poisoned, and that he didn't fully recover. And the anthropophysis and the um, Annie Besant's organization, he was part of this split in the, the, the Theosophical Society. There were some there were some magicians there. There may have been some uh, some um, some of the dark energy of the magical side too. So who knows? Um, I, I would have to follow up on that and find out more. But it, it just strikes <coughs> me as curious that someone thought he might have been poisoned because he was such a vital guy. He was in the middle of a hundred and one projects, and. Uh, speculate that he just died of sheer exhaustion <laughs> you know? but i don't think he was planning on dying anytime soon when he when he got ill and died i think it was in the middle of a, a, a whole lot of stuff so anyway it's a great story we should we should wrap up but uh zachary you joined late you probably caught enough to get the gist of where we were going with this do you have any thoughts and maybe before we wrap up mark uh after that and um you know it's what i've already heard has just been so rich i just it's I actually got the time wrong i moved a patient around so i could be here on time and then of course completely forgot that it was taking place and my wife turned to me about half an hour ago and said well, weren't you supposed to be on a call so that's what happened that's my life right now <laughs> But regardless, this, is, this was really interesting. And uh, I did browse uh, Gidley's paper, uh, which I was not aware of, and just really interested in this whole conversation. Um, I mean, my own interest, it's funny you're talking about the, the five bodies. I can show you this. You know, the clinic that I work with, with this doctor, you know, this is kind of his meta model of, um, you know, he uses the five bodies. Mm. Um, so I kind of find that interesting that he was someone who kind of took that from the East and adapted it to his own practice. Um, and allegedly it was something that he presented to the medical board back in the day when he was working in Sedona, Arizona, because um, some of the things that he was doing uh, actually threatened his license. And so he actually uh, referred back to this model, which really is four bodies and then the spirit. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of similar and of course we know that yeah. that that can be expanded there are multiple models that you know, develop on that and my own interest really is you know i've always been i always thought that i was a phenomenologist and then i started re reading the individuals who are deemed as phenomenologists and i thought i, I, I you know I, am i the phenomenologist or are they not phenomenal or who's who's who because i feel like i started reading them and i thought i thought phenomenology was just very much the subjective experience internally and comparing that with others and just getting some grounded orienting principles but of course i mean i think as john you were mentioning kind of you know derrida Deleuze, like some of those guys kind of went off into that area and i just my interest is really once again in um much more on the ground level of this like i'm, I'm all about the luminal like i really am but I'm very much interested in this idea that we still don't have an orienting, even integral theory. I mean, it's developmental, it's very rational, uh, but we don't have, it's like I, I, my work is really, I'm really interested in the upper left. Like how do we keep deconstructing the upper left ultimately in a way that might be taught in schools? The upper left meaning uh, Ken Wilber's upper left quadrant in his aqua, <laughs> all quadrants, right, thank all, you. all lines, all states, all types theory. Right. Yeah. Just, yeah. You know, so the just eye, the, the interior eye person. Right, the interior eye. Like what, you know, we all have very um, common, you know, and of course, exceptional subjective internal experiences. But there are a lot of commonalities to them that we still don't. So for me, that's, I just, you know, my own area where I have obsessed for a long time. So that's, you know, as this conversation goes, I'd like to see if there's a way I can, um, provide whatever value I can in terms of my own, you know, this is kind of the practice that I'm doing. And by the way, John, I, I, after you had suggested the Ericksonian hypnosis, I went back online and like purchased like four of his books. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, I, I, uh, I might be doing, uh, suggested by Dr. Klinghart here that, um, one of Ericksonian Erickson's, um, 
final students uh, does something called Trance Camp. Oh, I love him. Stephen Gilligan. Stephen Gilligan. Awesome. In July. Have you yeah, ever studied with him? Yes, I have. Oh, wow. Well, is back, this in the, back in the 90s. I was wow. studying he, Stephen no, Gilligan. You've really been everywhere. My God. It's really quite wonderful. No, I, <clears throat> most of what I'm talking about here comes out of direct, directly out of working with Stephen Gilligan. All oh, this stuff really? about maps, the, the, uh, the somatic self and the cognitive self. That so comes, that's, that that's, comes out of Gilligan. That's so, I'll leave it kind of this. is The one piece that I'm really interested in is well, one of the reasons I was a little bit disillusioned with Integral. I, I mean, disillusioned is too hard a word, but I feel like this multi-perspectival body that is not just, of course, rational. We know this and we all know this, right? But like the idea that there's, you know, the, the, the lens of the heart, you know, the processing system of the heart, the processing system of the body processing system of the emotions you know i kind of look at it sometimes i'll just tell people like oh it's like a four or five dimensional chessboard, you know and you can't we can't really play life just by looking at one board and so you know when i i'm really interested in applying that to moving all of those boards forward as as we continue talking about this um i think you would love gilligan because he's a he's a man he's a master at language and working with um, stabilizing ambiguities and wow. um, um, something that you said. Oh, phenomenology. Uh, yeah. I've been very disappointed in phenomenology. Yeah. Because uh, most of it's pretty bad phenomenology. Yeah, I, 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 I would Some almost. Some of it's good, but most of it sucks. I'm wanting to revive. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. I feel it like I want to be like Dolly who said, like, they're not the, I'm a surrealist. They're not the real surrealists aren't actually out there. It's not actually right. happening. I don't, I've right. always thought that was phenomenal. This, this doesn't make any sense to me. I'm kind of with Noam Chomsky on that angle as well. Mm-hmm. But I, I'll be with Stephen Gilligan hopefully in July so we can also wonderful, talk wonderful. about that. Yeah. I mean, he does a three week trance camp. So oh, I don't know it, if I'll do all three, but I'll do one, you know? It'll blow your mind. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Great. So that's, you know, like three cents. Well, well, thank you, Zachary. To yeah, be continued. Um, yeah. any, any closing thoughts, Mark? Just briefly, John was talking about uh, uh, knowing what you want, visualizing, and that how he appreciates the fact that he can go back and look at the, the tape uh, and I was just thinking about our conversation Sunday, Marco, where you should see, I know exactly what I want. And I, I think Marco has a fairly good idea. He, we've we've uh, imagined a actual physical Cosmos Cafe. And Marco has like, I don't know, 20 or 30 big, flat screen TVs and you can be running, <laughs> you can be running, the, what a, you know, you can have a, 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 a catalog or something wherever it is and just click it up, whichever one you want. You can watch three or four at once, <laughs> right? That's, that's in your imagination. <laughs> that's not my imagination. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's wonderful to get together in person. I'd love to have a, really, I would like to have a retreat center I still prefer the mountains than, you know, it's kind of the flat level where everything is a little bit crazy. But, yeah, I'd, I'd like to have a re- retreat center, a writing, a place to go to write. Um, you got your to pod. Write. I do, I do, but it's sometimes you have to, sometimes it, the environment matters, the energy field matters. And I think having, you know, a retreat is a retreat from something, but it's important to be able to go back and forth, to have a place to go where the, the you know, the, the constellation of factors is different, allows different things to come forth. And that's a dream. Uh, I don't have the money for it right now. Um, but we'll see. I think this is the next best thing to a retreat. Um, and I think I'm all for retreats. And I'm all for the, you know, getting away from the city and getting away from your life and going into a special place. And... Um, you know, going into altered states of consciousness or yoga or whatever. But I think I, I found myself having done a retreat, I come back to the city within about five minutes. <laughs> all of the stuff that I thought was going to happen once I get back to the city with the new things that I learned had evaporated. <laughs> I'm yelling and screaming at people and acting badly. <clears throat> and I think there's something 
very, and I said, fuck this retreat stuff. It's just useless. <laughs> but now I think that maybe I was uh, over ex- exaggerating just a bit because I think you could still have, we could all get together, find a location where we could all travel too easily. And then we could probably have a lot more fun and we could come back and then we could continue to do these conference calls where we could then re reignite or stabilize the, 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 the gains that we may have made. And I believe that could be a very good use of this technology mm. because I'm interested in stabilizing the insights or the understandings that you get up on the mountaintop. Can you bring that down into the valley? If you can't, of what use is that grand vision? And that's, I think, the challenge. And I believe the blessing that this technology might provide for us if we start using it in more creative ways than we were doing when we were addicted to Facebook. So I think that's a great idea. Mm. You know? And I think we're doing an, a mini retreat in these uh, conversations. Um, I think so. Together, opening up a very unusual space that I don't find anywhere else in, in my daily life. <laughs> you know? These are the things I do not talk about with my friends. <laughs> they would get their eyes glaze over, you know. So I think it's a sp- kind of special, uh, special space we're creating for one another. So we can go into these theoretical stuff that, you know, is so exploratory and try to find the right words for it. So thank you all very much for this opportunity once again. Yeah, By the way, done. next week, there's something that um, Lisa and um, her friend, Lynn Claire, um, Lynn Claire yes, Dennis. Lynn Claire Dennis, they they were interested in um, getting together on the cap, doing something on the cafe. So that's a that's a option that we could uh, discuss. And, uh, so because so, I know you know her work, Ed, right? You read her book, The Mary. Well, I haven't Ma- read her book. I started her book. It's a hard one. Yeah. 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 She's worked That's with why it'd be really nice to talk to her. <laughs> yeah. So is there any like introductory type of thing that uh, I saw a video on, on her website, Marion matrix, I think. Mm-hmm. Dot org. Um, and I think that would be wonderful. Uh, we were talking about knots before. That's and, Lou Kaufman. She wrote, she co-authored the book, Marion matrix with Lou Kaufman. Right. There's a, there's a picture. It's sort of, it's an interesting, really interesting looking picture because it's like, an image of earth, sky, space, cosmos, mm-hmm. and it's all braided together yeah. with this yeah. very unique shape. Uh, and this is another approach to metaphysics. Uh, mm-hmm. This is a whole other way of thinking about metaphysics, of what's really real, how what's real is shaped. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's some tie-ins, I think, as well to Tim Ingold uh, yeah, and I his think- work. Yeah, there's, there's a piece. Let me find it here. Uh, fiber metaphors weavers don't hate an interview with tim ingold uh, wow. and, and uh, an artist Could you touch that? I, Could you- I will i will because he has some interesting things to say about object-oriented ontology uh and he's really proposing a different way of having these discussions like he, he's more interested in the flow he's interested in lines material flows flows of awareness and i and he also talks about knots and this weaving metaphor this is this is a connection point Mm -hmm. um so i think that what the marion matrix is is doing is in a way applying that sort of different metaphoric uh approach you know to thinking about the whole to the metaphysics and be i would be i'm very interested in in well, it comes, out of, it comes out of her near-death experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, what she saw in her near-death experience took her about three years to recall it all. But uh, when she did, she presented it to Kaufman, who's a topologist. Mm. And, uh, he, saw, he thought the pattern was quite unique. Mm. And so they conducted a study together. And that's mm. what the Merriam Matrix is. But So I think it's a very... I think we're going to because of the medical setups and trauma and people being able to be revived from death and some of them who remember 
certain things that happened when they were wearing brain dead. Um, that's becoming a new field, near death studies. And uh, I think this is something that uh, Steiner was probably very attuned to. And he talked about a great deal, those subliminal spaces uh, between lives. Yeah. And um, there may be, I think, uh, some correlations between near death experience and what certain trans mediums are very gifted at check, you know, talking about what karma a person has. So anyway, that's, a, I think, a fertile area that we could explore with her. Mm. And phenomenology, I think, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so why don't we decide on some bite-sized uh, text? It could even be the video. It could be mm -hmm. just the general idea. It could be more of an appetizer type of talk than a full course. I, I asked her for a PDF, a file that uh, from the book if she could get like a short chapter or something, and maybe okay. look at her interview with Lisa. Lisa interviewed her. Um, mm -hmm. It's on Lisa's uh, website. Okay. On her blog. So, but but we could get Lisa in on this, and she can make she and she's there with Lynn uh, Lynn Claire in Spain right now. Mm -hmm. So, okay, good. Well, let's let's follow up okay. and make it happen. Cool. All right. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Good to see y'all. Bye. Have a good week. Likewise. Thank you. I'll see you then.